redefine mental health as a state of well-being in which an individual realizes his or her own abilities, can cope with the normal stress of life, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. Join Ambassador John Kamau, Tracy Kipto, and panelist Dr. Max Dati, Diane Kalei, and Dennis Maria as they dissect what, how, and when one can be defined as having mental health condition. We are really so sorry for the technical hiccup. Uh, there was some issue with our uh, <coughs> multi streaming. So, unfortunately, we are going to be live only on Facebook, and therefore, uh, we, are, we apologize for that. Uh, my name is Ambassador John Kamau, and you're watching Diaspora TV Australia. And today, we're here to talk about mental health. And um, uh, if you're not sharing it, you are carrying it when it comes to mental health. And mental health is one health condition that has affected so many people in the whole wide world. Now today we are going to discuss and we are going to go right into it. Uh, come on Tracy. Hello, I'm Tracy Kipto and today I'll be co-hosting the show tonight. Uh, the survey that was done two years ago told us like one in five Australians have a, mental health, have a mental health condition or any mental health like signs or they have or they will suffer in the future. This is about 20% of the whole population, which is about 4.8 million Australians actually suffering from this thing. Our, panel, our panelists tonight will assist us to elaborate on exactly what is mental health and hopefully we can reduce the stigma about it. We will start with a brief introduction from each one of, one of them and starting with Diane. Hi, my name is Diane Calais and I am a psychological science graduate and I am currently working as a behavioural therapist at Autism SA with children on the spectrum. Hi, my name is Maxwell Lati. I'm a GP. Um, I see uh, quite a number of mental health issues in my day-to-day -day practice. It will be interesting to see how we go with the discussion. Hello everyone, my name is Judy. I have worked in the disability sector for the last nine years. Currently, I'm working within a project that is funded by the Federation of uh, Ethnic Communities Council of South Australia just to support people from cow backgrounds with disability. I am excited to share, uh, amongst other things, what, um, what services are available for people from cow communities. Um, hello, my name is Pifla Sashe. Um, I'm here as a mental health um, person who suffers from mental illness. Hello, my name is Dennis Maria. I'm the country manager here at Options Education Agency Australia. And currently, right now, we're situated in Adelaide, which is one of our two offices here in Australia. The other one is in Perth. Uh, Australia. I'm also an education agent and our business aims to bring international students from uh, all different parts of the world. Thank you everyone for the wonderful introduction. We'll now go directly to our topic tonight and we'll start with Dr. Max who will help us explain what exactly mental health is. Thank you, thank you. Now I'll simply put it this way that Mental health simply refers to the state of the mind and it refers to the state of the mind at a point in time or over a period of time. Now, we can say um, the mind or we can say mental health can be quite stable or sound or we can say someone's mental health is disordered. Now, this needs to be taken in the context of culture and also in the context of societal norms. Uh, when it comes to this discussion, at the end of the day, I would want everyone to take home one simple message. That is, the way we, feel, the way we think affects the way we feel. And the way we feel affects the way we act. In other words, our thoughts affect our feelings and our feelings affect our actions. 
uh, on the whole life flows from day to day life flows from our thoughts and uh, when it comes to life life throws a lot of challenges every single day to all of us and I can say that our thoughts are ordered by our memories for instance when I was a child growing up in Ghana what happens is every time I visit the doctor I get a needle so in my mind I know that every time one visits a doctor you have a needle but until I grew up a bit older I realized that it's not always the case what am I trying to say what I'm trying to say here is that when your thoughts or your life's experiences helps you to build memory and this memory is laid down in the brain and out of this memory flows our thoughts and these thoughts affect our feelings and in turn affects our actions so basically put we can say mental health is broad you can put it as a spectrum and I'll say you can be of sound mind you can be a little bit worried day by day and you can end up also being if it gets too much out of hand you can get feeling down you feel a bit depressed you feel anxious and this can go as far as someone having so much stress in their life that you end up having uh, losing control of what you do day by day so if I want to put this in a context, I would say, if I put colors to it, we would say we have a green zone, we have a red zone, we have, sorry, green zone, yellow zone, red zone, and black zone. And all of us are on this spectrum. Uh, most people will be able to manage their life quite easily and well. And if you find yourself in the green zone, you find out that, well, life goes on every day the challenges are there nobody um, is free of challenges but most people manage it quite well and you when we say you're in the green zone probably we'll say you can you're paying your bills you're functioning day to day you wake up every day and um, you are coping quite well but then as life throws the challenges for instance I can say I'm a dad I'm a, a husband, I'm a doctor, uh, I'm someone's son, I'm someone's brother, I'm someone's uh, uncle, and quite apart from this, I'm a worker as well. So life throws a lot of challenges, and most people are able to cope with it quite well. But what happens is it gets to a stage where it becomes too much for an individual. And we call these stresses, things that can cause you to break down. So in a nutshell, I would say that most people cope quite well in life. But then situations get out of hand where people begin to sort of crumble under pressure. And they don't get only physically exhausted, but mentally exhausted. And then their coping mechanisms sort of fail them. That is where people begin to have deranged mental state. So if I would put it simply, I would say, if you're in the green zone, everything's going fine. But you might find that you find yourself in a yellow zone where you end up having a few sleepless nights, not being able to cope with day-to-day -day functioning, you're not eating well, you find yourself thinking a lot, your sleep patterns change. Um, your social life changes you just withdraw from society and life begins to get the better of you and that is where we realize that your mental state is getting deranged it can go as far as losing control to the point where you stop seeing people you stop uh, socializing you can't function day by day and you just withdraw from society your concentration changes and uh, a lot more yeah. yeah thank you so much for that getting back to you would you please let us know what are the types of these conditions okay uh 
we can divide mental health into a few a few groups i'll just i've just put a few things in uh, order here so we can i'll just go through it fairly quickly now we do have it's classified along the lines of uh, what we call uh, i mean there's a book that puts it in order it's called we call it the dsm4 but i'll simply put it this way we do have mood disorders now when we say mood disorders we're talking about depression we're talking about people who have uh, bipolar affective disorders uh, we do have anxiety disorders where you have generalized anxiety people have panic disorders where little things make them panic we do have post-traumatic stress disorders where past traumas or things that people have gone through keeps affecting them as they go along in life although the stressor is not there other things remind them of it we do have uh, eating disorders we have age related disorders so i'll just put it simply in those categories but the common ones that we come across in our day-to-day -day life is anxiety disorders which is um, anxiety depression post uh, post Traumatic stress disorders, postnatal depressions, um, and personality disorders. But by far and large, the commonest will be anxiety and depression. Another thing that I would like us to understand today is what are the signs to look for? What are the symptoms? When do you actually know someone is getting to the yellow zone? Mm. When do they get to the red zone? Mm. And how do they end up in the black zone? Okay. So I would say, as life goes on, the pressures come, you know. The first thing that you will find if you are not coping well, probably would be, you just find yourself feeling tired for no good reason. You might find yourself withdrawing from what you normally do socially. You know, let's say you love seeing people and socializing with people. If this goes on for more than two weeks at a time, we need to question whether you are going okay. Um, you might find yourself, as I said, not sleeping well, or you might find yourself sleeping too much, or you might find yourself having, instead of sleeping at night, you sleep in the day and stay up the whole night, not being able to sleep. You might find, one might find himself, um, Again, not eating well, not being able to concentrate on tasks that you normally take easily, do easily. You are not able to concentrate on those. Mm -hmm. You might find yourself unmotivated. It's like things that you usually do pretty quick. You just find yourself, I can't be bothered doing them. You, know? you might find yourself um, having thoughts like, why, why am I here? What am I doing here? Do I really need to continue with life? You know, Friends ring you and you just turn the phone off. Or you see the number you don't want to answer. Which is not the normal you. So sometimes people notice these themselves. Other times it's those around them that notice it. So when you find yourself in having these symptoms, most likely you are in the yellow zone. Or if a friend asks you, you know, we don't see much of you anymore. You know, you don't seem to be the usual bubbly self. What's going on? Uh, those are all signs that things could be going wrong. So that, that mostly falls in the yellow zone. People are just coping, you know, but they sort of tend to keep it to themselves. Yeah. Red zone is when people get really out of hand. They don't want to get out of home. They don't want to see anyone. Some stop eating or some eat so much, you know. So um, some begin to become aggressive. Yeah. So in the family setting or in social settings, you just find themselves, they find themselves being irritable. And little things that normally do not upset them begin to upset them. And they... I'll, I'll put it this way, they sometimes become very short, you know, and uh, um, the, the way people try to cope with this is sometimes they medicate themselves with either drugs or with alcohol. 
and then that also snowballs into getting into violent behavior or disinhibitory behavior where people begin to uh, sort of assault other members of the family or talk indiscriminately. So that brings people to the red zone where they begin to come into onto the radar of the health system or the law enforcement agencies. Yeah, so you might get a phone call saying someone is being violent at home and uh, or is drunk and misbehaving at home mm -hmm. which is not the usual behavior of the person yeah. but then this begins to show up so that begins to tell us that the one is getting out of hand or is getting to the red zone yeah. the black zone is usually a point where people begin to feel like i don't want to be here anymore what's the point in being here what am i doing here i'm better just sort of end my life yeah. and some people succeed in doing that um, or if not ending their lives, they begin to harm themselves. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Latte. Uh, you've given a very good introduction. Now, lucky today we have so many people who have a lot of experiences. And at this point, uh, I would like us to hear from Anne Flora. Now, our viewers tonight, we have Anne Flora Sachet. I hope I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> and. Um, She's the one person that has gone through mental health and she's happy to come out. And maybe you are out there and you're asking yourself, how do, where do I start? How can I come out? How can I uh, discuss my issues and what I'm going through? So let's hear this testimony from Anne Flora. And uh, from there, we will have Diane, who is a psychologist, uh, take over from there. Thank you so much, Anne. Welcome to the show. Um, thank you so much, Ambassador. Um, as you heard, my name is Anne Flora Sache. Um, I'm a wife to Scott Sache, and I've got three beautiful children. Um, and on top of that, I, um, uh, I suffer from mental illness, mental issues. That is, I've got bipolar, I've got uh, um, borderline personality disorder, I've got anxiety, I've got... Um, clinical depression, and I've got post-traumatic uh, post disorder. So, uh, yeah, it is not, <laughs> it's something not, it's not a few, it's a lot, because when people see me, especially when I go to work and I have a whole Webster pack, they're like, what? You look like one of those old people taking this. And I'm like, yeah. And it took me a long time to like accept it and talk about it to other people because it was not easy because you find people judge you a lot by your looks they look at you they say oh no 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 you don't look like you've got mental issues oh no 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 it's just a usual stress oh, no, no, no. but they don't know my journey my journey just to make it short because it's a very long one all i'm gonna say is i i was diagnosed with mental issues when i was 12 years and that is in 1996. I was born in 1983, so 1996, when I was 12 years, I was diagnosed with this. And I started seeing a psychiatrist and a psychologist at that time. And it was very, very hard uh, on my family, especially because my mom was, was ready for it. You know, she wanted me to go through this and all that stuff. Whereas my dad was different because he did not understand why, you know, a 12 year old is a child. What, why are you getting depression? Why are you getting all this for, you know? Probably it's attention, probably it's this and this and this, but that was not the issue. I had my own, own issues. And um, since then, so you can imagine guys, since then I've either been, cause even when I was diagnosed at, at um, at 12 years old, the doctors, the, the psychiatrists that I was, uh, I was seeing and stuff refused to give me medication. So I used to go and talk to them and all that stuff, do therapy, but I couldn't, they were not giving me any medication and all that stuff. They're like, you're too young, you're too young and everything. And anyone who's in Kenya, they know. I used to see Dr. Um, Gatere. He died now. God rest his peace. He was a very nice guy. Um, I went and saw Dr. Frank Jenga, who is still there, uh, but 
just his attitude and everything, I decided that I didn't want to see him. And I settled with Dr. Pius Kigamo. Right now he's like the head of something. He, 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 he was a very good doctor and he understood everything. And he tried to understand it to my dad because my dad wouldn't understand it. You know, he's like, there's nothing you don't, my mom would. And there's nothing you don't have. Mama, what's wrong with you and all that stuff. Anyway, long story short, um, I attempt. I tried. I attempted suicide four times. I didn't die in all those times. I was saved. And my doctor, Dr. Kigamo, actually made a joke. One day he told me, look, you've been trying to go for like four times and you're not dying. You're brought here. You're taken to ICU. We pump your stuff out. Don't you think maybe God really doesn't want you here? You know, he made that joke and it actually made an impact. I was like, probably not, you know. And then after that, when I decided to come to Australia, you know, for a whole year I was fine. Like, I was not on medication or anything. And then I started feeling I'm not okay. Because when you have all these, there's, there's, uh, there's, you have triggers. And at the same time, you have... You have this thing that you feel you're like, I'm not okay. So I went there, had medication and all that. That was even before I met my husband. So when I met my husband, I was okay. Didn't explain to him. I just told him, oh, I've got a little bit of depression. I'm okay and everything. And when we were expecting our first child, then that's when, because with all the hormones and everything, that's when it first happened. And then I gave birth and I did not want anything to do with, my, with our first one, with him. And I would try and, and, and um, strangle the baby. I didn't want anything to do. I would go out, come back like at 2 or 3 in the morning. He's left with the baby and all that stuff. So um, as time went by, I ended up being admitted. At, uh, I've been at Glenside. I've been at Helen Mayo. Helen Mayo is a house where if you've got uh, babies and stuff, it's for mothers and babies. You go there, you stay there for a while. I've been to uh, the the one here at uh, what is it called? The Law Mark? No, the other one. The one at uh, the one at Modbury. Woodley House. Woodley House. I've been there. I ran away from. <laughs> I was there at Woodley House. I ran away from Woodley House. Um, funny thing. There's this place that they show in Melbourne where country Victoria, where people go and they like. It's like a, 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 um, they go, they jump over a cliff and kill themselves. So I, I kept on seeing it on the news and I was like, maybe God wants me to do this. Because then I, was, I wasn't okay. And I actually packed up my bags. I don't know how I got to the city where I was able to catch a bus. I do not know how because I had never caught a bus. And I got to Melbourne. And just when I was about to catch another bus, the cops now were called and they knew this was something. So I also had to stay in Melbourne. So anyway, as I was saying, it's not been easy. It's still a journey. I take lots of medication. I take almost 18 tablets a day uh, for everything that happens with me. Um, it's not easy because I have my good days and I have my bad days. But through my story, I've had a lot of people who come to me and talk to me about it, especially here. And some of them are a bit embarrassed. They don't want their friends to know about it. They don't want their family to know about it. And I talk to them about it because for me, I'm not embarrassed anymore. You know, because I notice the more I talk about it, the more it actually helps me sometimes. And even through all that that I go through when I was in hospital and all that, I had my friends, I had people who come, they encourage you, people who take my kids, who do all that stuff so whoever you are there i'll just tell you you know what it's not as bad as it seems you might yes be have been diagnosed with this and especially coming from a culture where they don't understand they tell you toughen up you need to toughen up you know there are people who are starving there are people who are so sick and you're thinking okay i know they are but that's not I, i'm not that's not how i'm feeling you know and i've also got into a point where I any time that I have that feeling, I, I will talk to people. There are people that I talk to, especially my husband. I'll tell him, honey, you know what? I'm not feeling okay. And I think I'm going to flip. Take me to hospital. Or I need to do this and this and this. I need a PRN or something like that. And that really helps a lot. 
So if you're there and I'm asking you if you have any problems or anything, talk to someone, talk to a friend, talk to your parents, talk to whatever, decide to go and see a doctor. The doctor here was telling us all the triggers, all everything that happens and what you need to do. Please do that, you know? Do that, it's gonna help you so, so much. Sometimes it's not easy for my kids because they see how I am and they cry because they don't understand it and that hurts me a lot, that hurts me a lot. But I, I'm able to try and say, you know what? Um, okay, babies, I'm gonna be trying and be strong for you guys, you know? Even my friend here, she's been here. She's taking care of my kids when I was in hospital. She knows my story. She's, you know. So, yeah, guys, there is help out there. And that, and I love a show like this that's here because it's helping you guys realize, you know what? Help is there. You're not going to be judged. People will come and, and, and listen to you and talk to you and give you the right avenues and routes that you need to do. So, thank you so much and God bless you. Thank you so much, Anne. That was so good and that you can be able to explain to people what you've been through and um, it's such a touching story. I have people here, uh, like I have Nancy Bilgen here, she's saying you are a hero, and Flora. Thanks for sharing your story. You will help so many people and God bless you so much. Um, you know, it's, um, it's, 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 they say, it's, it's good not to be okay. Not for people, you know, you don't have to be afraid of anyone. You, for you to expl express yourself to say that you are not okay, that is absolutely fine. Now, thank you everyone that is following us from Facebook. I can see Anthony Wambogo. You are saying you are following us from Kenya. Uh, Nancy from Sydney. Uh, we have Irene Waigua. You are saying, that you are following from Nairobi Nyamakima, very interesting things. Um, and um, thanks uh, from Nyawira as well. Nyawira Muredi is saying thanks, Flo. You are an inspiration to anyone. And uh, at that point, we also have someone here. Uh, she is in Melbourne. I know it's a him. His name is Kamau Karanja. I don't know whether our director can bring him in via video link to share briefly about his struggles as, a, as an international student with mental health. Uh, the struggles led to mental health. And then from there, we are going to hear from Diane. Uh, our director, are you able to bring in uh, Isaac? Is he in? No? Okay. Oh, he's, he's on. Um, I can see him. <laughs> well, uh, we'll get back to you, uh, uh, Mr. Kamau Karanja, but at this point I want to bring uh, Diane Kalei. And after that, Judy, uh, for those of you who are watching from Australia, Judy is here. She represents multicultural uh, SA. And uh, she has information as to how, if you're here in Australia, how you can access help. So stay tuned. You'll get a lot of information today. So let's hear from Diane. You've heard from uh, Anne. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you also hear from Kamaoka. And there's so many people who are struggling here uh, with education. They're struggling with their marriages. And these challenges are leading to mental health. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I can see you're you are, you are, you are already teary from the story from Anne. Uh, now as a psychologist, bring it now from the perspective of a psychologist. Mm. Is it okay not to be okay? Mm. And um, tell us, how can we deal with this mountain of a thing called mental health? Um, firstly, I just want to commend Flora for her story. That was so courageous and your story is harrowing and it will help anyone who is listening and I hope that you can keep inspiring others. Um, I work with autistic children so I don't necessarily work with um, like adults um, that have mental health issues um, but I feel like growing up here I've definitely been able to notice like some patterns um, that for me I think concern me growing up here because like um, you said Dr. Um, mental illness can you know be experienced at one point in your life or you know a period of time in your life 
And so I feel like possibly most of us, majority of us, would have definitely experienced some kind of mental strain or illness um, throughout some point in our life. And so I feel like, you know, this is a great kind of starting point to start to dismantle the stigma that comes alongside mental health. Um, and I feel as though, especially within the African community, is that we need to start opening up this dialogue of mental health and start having this conversation because it's actually happen happening to majority of us. And I feel as though it shouldn't be this taboo subject that I feel it has been for so long. Yeah. And it's really interesting um, because Flora had said something in, you know, in her story that people back home and even I think our attitudes, you know, as Africans towards mental illness, I don't think it's quite recognized at all. Um, it's kind of pushed to the side. And, you know, I see that and I, and I wonder whether that attitude comes because let's say back home, maybe we're, 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 we're just trying to, you know, feed our children. Uh, we're trying to go to our jobs, we're trying to pay bills. And, and so I wonder whether this attitude towards not really focusing on mental illness comes from just trying to actually survive um, and trying to just get things done in life, um, especially back home where, you know, things may not necessarily come as easily as it does here. Um, that's, you know, my, you know, perspective. But I wonder whether because there have been so many other pressing matters to attend to, is that I think mental illness actually gets pushed to so far, you know, you know, out of our minds that even if someone was to mention it, it becomes this taboo subject and it doesn't get the recognition or, you know, discussion that it deserves. And I feel as though there there is so much power in um, communicating and discussing mental illness. And I feel like, you know, I feel like a lot of, or some of the issues that we even encounter in our communities really stem from a lack of communication about how we are feeling mm -hmm. and what we are going through and putting up this facade and just going ahead. But I feel like in doing so, when we're, you know, pushing it, you know, suppressing our emotions, putting up this facade, it manifests in really detrimental ways. And I feel as though it actually becomes like a ripple effect. And, you know, I think even like you mentioned our, I think it was our thinking actually affects our actions. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, our actions also affect those that we are around. And that's why I say it is a ripple effect. Um, and so I feel as though um, it, it, it just kind of cycles. So, you know, you're feeling this way, we're not talking about it, no one's acknowledging it. Um, it manifests in a certain type of way, um, which of course can be some of the mental, you know, health disorders that we've mentioned before. Um, but also these actions can affect, you know, the people around us. And then, you know, it begins again from, from them. And so I feel like there is so much power in starting a conversation, particularly in, you know, you know, our communities about mental health illness. And I feel as though it is definitely okay not to be okay. And I think sometimes, I'm not too sure where it even comes from, but I think sometimes in our communities, we always have to be okay. We always have to be strong, you know, for those around us or, you know, those coming, you know, after us and our children and our, you know, family and all of that. And I feel like in doing so, we're doing almost ourselves and those around us a disservice by, always having to be, I'm fine, I'm strong, we're not gonna talk about emotions. Um, and I, I, I honestly feel like it is a disservice and I feel like it is definitely okay not to be okay. At the end of the day, we're, we're only humans and we have our moments where we don't feel great and, and that's fine and I feel as though when we can even realize that, you know what, I'm not feeling that good or you know, I, I, like I just actually need some time to myself um, I feel as though we need to definitely, you know, serve ourselves in doing that and liberate ourselves in the fact that, you know what, we, you know, I'm not feeling okay and it's okay not to, um, and to even begin to, you know, to address that so that it doesn't cycle on and we don't impact those around us um, negatively. Um, so, yeah, I, w I would love to see um, this conversation about mental health continuing. Um, especially in our communities because I feel as though 
you know, communication is 100% number one. And, you know, I think even a lot of the traumas that maybe we have been, you know, affected or has, you know, been implicated on us has probably been from someone who's never addressed their emotions. Absolutely. But in saying that, you know, I can 100%, you know, um, recognize it is super um, confronting trying to confront your demons or trying to confront yourself. And it definitely, you know, it's easier said than done to go and deal with your, you know, emotions and how you're feeling. You know, it's, it's so easy to say it, but to actually do it and to start to dig into your own life, into the person you are and to confront yourself and look at yourself face to face is it's so hard. And I think um, that's also why it's so easy to push that to the side and be like, I've got other things to do. I don't have time to start worrying about my mm -hmm. own demons mm -hmm. and look at who I am as a person, mm -hmm. you know, because it's scary. Mm -hmm. It's 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 not easy. And so, um, you know, th there are obviously, you know, supports, you know, especially here in Australia and in our communities that we can access. But, um, yeah, I can absolutely acknowledge it's, it's, it's so, it's so hard. It's so hard to confront yourself and your demons. However, you know, once I guess we get there and go on that journey, I think it's, 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 it's worth it. Um, not only for yourself, but for those around you. So, yeah, that's my point of view on <laughs> mental health. Yeah, thank you so much, Dan, for that. And as you guys have heard, it's okay mm. not to be okay. Mm. You don't have to feel like you're alone. You mm. can go out there, talk to someone, talk to a professional person. Mm. I know that just the way you would have a cold, get your nose blocked, the same thing mm. when you have like mental health, when you have your mind not going well, see someone, take care of yourself the way you would have taken care of yourself if you had a cold. Mm. You take a rest, do the same with your mentor, mm. take a rest. Yeah. We can't see it and probably by the time we see it, it's gonna be too late. So act as soon as you notice things are not being right. It's better off to seek help and know you are not suffering than not to seek help and people mm. notice it when it's already too way beyond. And the next person we'll be having is Kamau Karanja, and he'll be joining us online and tell us a bit more about himself and his journey on mental health. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Kamau Karanja. I'm in Melbourne. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, my name is Kamau Karanja. Uh, from Kabon. Uh, my school is Mentor Foundation. Started long ago since I was young. But uh, I got diagonal, 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 so, so I've been for, for, for more than a year, year. Uh, living uh, in, 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 in a, 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 a different world of my mind with other, other people, people in this, in world. this world. So, so mental, mental condition, condition is, is to me to is me just is like any like other irritation. And if you seek help, there is a lot of help outside there. And medical practitioners are out there. Hello. Uh, got a technical, got a technical problem. problem. Can you hear can me, you now? me now? Yes, yes, we can. Uh, uh, okay, okay, I was okay, saying I have uh, lived uh, uh, for a long time in dark time. Uh, no.
Halo. So di so di so di so di. Ah, I was saying that. I have, I have lived more than 30 years, years, more than 30 years, years in a different world of mind with other, other people, people in this world. It's not a good feeling because I didn't get help when I was young, but right now I have uh, I got help. And what I can say is that I have stood on my own two feet. And that's the only most important thing in this life is to stand on own, on your own feet. And other people who who other people who are living in this world who are having better mental condition than others, it's better to help others achieve their goals. So me, I don't want to talk too much about it. Uh, at the moment, I have proper treatment, I have proper treatment plan and follow up and care. And I'm working now. Uh, I'm back to school. Uh, I had problem as an international student because of my mental problem. So... I don't want to talk much and thank you because thank you here you were because of technical problem i am having technical problems i'm sorry i would like to end it there thank you thank you so much for your time tonight i really appreciate your story and it's gonna literally help someone out there thank you I will have now a little short break and then we'll be back soon with more about the topic.